and uh, welcome to my home. I tonight I'm going to offer you two stories, one from Lincoln Center in New York and one from the Kennedy Center in Washington. I don't want to say any more about either of them right now because I'm liable to let cats out of bags and that would destroy the whole setup. So let me start by saying for the 1977 season opener, the New York City Opera offered that great double bill, that great Verismo double bill, Cavalleria Rusticana, rustic chivalry. chivalry, if you will, by Pietro Mascagni, and I Pagliacci, the clowns, by Ruggiero Leon Cavallo. These two composers, and those that followed their lead, wanted to present to people a real slice of life. The word verismo, veristic, really true to form, true to life. They wanted to set up situations where human beings would deal with whatever the situation was and give you a feeling of human angst, tragedy, and whatever. Usually there were three elements that you found in these and you still find in them. Number one, a romantic and sometimes illicit love affair. Number two, a devastating betrayal. And number three, the settling of accounts. Cav and Pag, as they're known in the business, have been side by side since their first performances. Both are stunningly beautiful, and in the case of Pagliacci, unique. No one before or since Leon Cavallo has managed to bring a play within a play concept to the stage in such a dramatic, in such a wonderful way. In the opera, the characters in the opera must imitate their lives in a comedy that reveals their true identity. And it is absolutely a shock. It's brutal, it's ferocious, and so in many ways is the Cavalleria Rusticana which precedes it. The general idea of Cavalleria, I don't know where I am this evening, is as follows. Santuzza has given herself to Turidu, who is in love with Lola, who is married to Alfio, who is absent and out of town quite an awful lot. When Turidu refuses to solve Santuzza's honor problem by not marrying her, she spills the beans about Turidu and Lola to Alfio, and Alfio settles accounts. Both of these operas last about 70 minutes, an hour and 10, and both, I was to find out, need mental and physical timing, preparation, thought. I was not aware of what was needed at the time. I was full out. Every bar was a full bar of energy. And I had no idea where I was going with it, but I found out. And you will too as we go along tonight. And I also didn't know that Verismo Opera carries with it interpolated high notes all over the place, which I suppose is usual and, and expected because opera is, of course, about high notes. And there were times, and there are times in the music where there uh, are rhythmical things that are different than what is printed. And there's no indication whatever about these things. Imagine my surprise when I finished studying these pieces and got a feel for what I wanted to do with them. After hearing a one or two recordings, I was bewildered because I was looking at a page of music that didn't seem to be interpreted correctly, or at least was not being honored in the way that it was written by the performers. I took this concern to my conducting teacher, Franco Ferrara, who said to me, these men were men of the theater. If a singer came up to them and said, Maestro, I think I can make the audio more effective if I did this, and they bought it, they'd say, leave that in. And after a while, there were many suggestions and many things accepted. The fact of the matter is that once a performance practice was in vogue, Nobody ever went back and corrected the scores. The scores are really the way that they were originally. So you sort of have to know what's going on in order to do them. There are actually bars in uh, Calvary Rusticana that are twice as slow, twice as fast, 
and there are a couple of places where uh, it's, it, the time changes dramatically. But Ferrara summed it all up. He said, be flexible and expect the unexpected. In opera, it happens all the time. How true his words were for that fateful opening night in New York City. I need to tell you that the tenor and the soprano for Calvaria hated each other openly. Whenever they rehearsed, all other people in the room somehow found something more important to do outside and left, usually leaving only myself, the rehearsal pianist, and the assistant stage director with a book that had the staging in it in case there were questions as to who was doing what. And there always were, and they were violent. These two people never looked at each other in the eye. They would address the stage director, the assistant stage director, saying, would you tell her that she's too loud here? Will you tell him to go jump in the lake? Will you tell her that she's falling in the wrong spot when I push her? And so it would go. Now, one would question why City Opera would keep these two artists performing together and not killing each other. But there was a very good reason. Because in the duet between Santuzza and Turidu is a knockdown, drag out affair. Carrying this kind of energy into that scene made for great theater. I myself got quite involved in it and I found it draining, exciting, but draining, I must say. Again, I had no idea how to pace a show in any way, whatever. The Pagliacci cast was good, good colleagues. And Herman Malamud, the tenor singing Cano was one of the most solid play singers in the business. Diana Soviero, his lovely wife in the, in the opera, Nedda, recalled their first meeting, which happened to be in the middle of a Pagliacci, when he came on stage dressed as the clown and said, Hi, I'm Herman. Because the man that was scheduled to play uh, the, the part had gotten sick midway through the performance. We opened Cavalleria, and it was a great success. Obviously with what was the baggage that was carried into the performance and the, the mu music itself, it really was quite a spectacular show. I gave it everything that I had. And I was sitting on the desk, uh, the couch in the conductor's lounge and came to the brutal, brutal realization that in about 15 minutes, I had to get back in there and crank up another 70 minute knock down, drag out opera. How was I ever going to do that? I started bemoaning the fact that I had given so much in the one and kind of figured how I even had no idea how I was going to handle the next one. When the phone rang at, on the desk, it was stage manage, management upstairs. Maestro, you can go to the pit door. Usually at City Opera, when you had taken your baton, locked the door, and gotten to the pit door, the red light above it would be turning green, and you'd hear a click, which would open the door for you to go in. I got there, the light was red, and I waited. And I waited. And I waited, and the light was still red, and I thought, what, something's going wrong here, or maybe somebody forgot to throw the switch. I was about to go back to the maestro's room and call upstairs when it finally did turn green, and in I went. Every step of the way, I thought, how am I going to make this work? I'm exhausted. The audience was applauding. The orchestra and I took our bows, and we settled in to the performance. The baritone came out and sang the prologue in a wonderful, wonderful way. He was a fabulous artist. Pablo Elvira was his name. The audience went nuts, and we were well on our way. Now the clown troupe enters, and the caño, the tenor, invites the villagers to a special performance, a comedy that they have worked out and is going to present it right on stage here at 11 o'clock at night. All through this first section, though, I noticed that his voice was kind of raspy in a way, certainly in a way that I hadn't heard at the dress rehearsal. But then this was my first Pagliacci and I was exhausted already and I really thought, well, maybe I wasn't hearing well, well and on we went. At the end of the scene, there's an interpolated high B which all tenors take all the time. Except this time, Herman 
sang it down an octave where it was written. And I thought, well, that's strange. He always took it up, but nevertheless, it was my first Pagliacci, and on we went. Two scenes later, Kanyo comes back on the scene to surprise his wife, Nedda, with her lover. He's back, far back in the stage, in the shadows, barely visible. And he goes, ah! And she says to her lover, Fuji! Which means escape. Off he runs, and Kanyo in hot pursuit. It was strange, though, that ah didn't seem to come from where Herman was. It was coming from somewhere over here. But it was my first Pagliacci. There was an awful lot of change music going on, so we went on and, and we continued. But when Herman came back on the stage, starting to uh, insist that his wife give him the name of her lover before he kills her, he, it was, th there was no doubt. He wasn't singing anymore. He was merely mouthing his wor his, the words. The voice was coming from somewhere else. So I looked over into the pit, <clears throat> and behind the trombones on the right-hand side, far back, was a little man standing carrying a, a vocal score to Pagliacci, and a man behind him with a flashlight so he could see what he was doing. Now I had to deal with something else that I hadn't planned on at all, and this being the first time I'd ever done the work. Right now we were approaching the pinnacle of the entire opera, Vesti la Giuba. Ridi pagliaccio. At the beginning of the recit part, a lady stood up in the third or fourth row and shrieked, Sing, Herman! Sing! So Herman starts to sing. Now we have two tenors singing the beginning of Vesti la Giuba. I realized that Herman was not going to stop so I cut the other man off and allowed Herman to set the world's record for the fastest Vesti La Juba ever sung. That is, if anybody actually heard it, because his voice was now reduced to a whisper. After the aria is over, the orchestra kind of pans out, and then there's a beautiful interlude, an intermezzo. Usually, that intermezzo links Act One and Act Two of Pagliacci. Act Two is only about 20 minutes long. And in the city opera version, it's a pantomime. You see Kanyo and Nedda suiting up for the performance, putting the uh, flower on their faces, and she goes and has him zip her up, and so on and so forth, and they try to make life the way it was, but of course it can never be again. In the second part of the opera, Herman merely mouthed the words and stayed out of it. But I noticed the gentleman in the pit was rather uncertain about certain things he was doing or how I was taking the piece. So I looked right at him and said, or mouthed, watch me. And after that, it went smoothly. At the end of the cur as soon as the curtain came down, Julius Rudell, the general manager of the opera uh, company, came out with a microphone in his hand. He was greeted with cheers and jeers. He brought out the two tenors. Malamud was about six feet tall. Kenny Collins, who was the mysterious man in the pit, was only about five, six. And Rudell said, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, it was impossible for us to suit up Mr. Collins in time to do this performance when Mr. Malamud took ill. This was the only way we could assure of a performance of any kind. Anyone who does not agree with us and wants his money back, please go to the box office. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Good night. As I walked back to my dressing room, it suddenly became clear to me why I was standing outside so long with that red light on. They were making a public announcement that Mr. Malamud was not in best voice, that he was indisposed, is the way that they say it, and that he would beg the audience's indulgence, he would try his best to do a performance for you. I was the only one in the entire theater that didn't know what was going on. But as Maestro Ferrara said, Always expect the unexpected. In opera, it happens all the time. Amen. That's story number one. Story number two. <laughs> Martin Feinstein 
was the general director of the Washington Opera. Now I believe it's called the Washington National Opera, but the Washington Opera from 1980 till 1996. I was a regular on, on all 16 seasons, and I conducted 24 operas in that time for him. Martin was an opera enthusiast. He started his great love of the art form being an usher, volunteer usher at the Met, the old Met. And though I'm not sure when he was engaged by Saul Hurok, he became a PR uh, representative for the Saul Hurok Artist Agency. There he made contacts of, and, and made friends with an awful lot of people, including some of the great artists of our time, and not just in the realm of opera. In 1981, he devised a clever idea of having a fundraiser for the opera that he had just taken over. How he managed to lure down to Washington the people that graced the stage that night in the, uh, the Terrace Theater would make a very interesting book to read. Now, I can't remember practically everyone that was there, although I'm going to come close, I hope. These were the people that he got down there. Sid Caesar, Imogene Coca, Gene Stapleton, Christopher Plummer, Tammy Reed, Tammy Grimes, sorry, Tammy Grimes, Jerome Hines, famous bass, Catherine Malfitano, at that time a young superstar, and the entire cast of the Barbara Seville that was performing the Barbara Seville every other night in that same theater. The Terrace Theater, ladies and gentlemen, is a, um, like a, a, an amphitheater, but it's small, very small. When you enter the theater, you enter the very last row, and then you go down the stairs this way, and the stage is at the very bottom, and the pit below it. Only 450 seats. So the people that came to hear this gala event probably paid a pretty penny. With those people on the stage, you would think, yes, it probably did cost quite an awful lot. But the real plum in Martin's hat was the fact that he talked Ethel Merman into coming down. Ethel Merman had always wanted to sing You're Just in Love from Call Me Madam with Jerome Hines, one of her great to do bucket lists things. And Martin was clever enough to play heavily on that and said, if I get, Mar if I get Jerry to come down, he always wanted to be called Jerry. I, I worked with him several times, and so if I do call him Jerry, please forgive me. He liked it that way. He says, if I can get Jerry to come in and sing with you, will you come? And she said, yes. And so did Hines, and therefore she was going to be there. Now, she almost canceled because she had a blood clot in her leg. And for two weeks she was in the hospital with that leg up as they tried to dissipate the danger that would have happened had she gotten up and walked around. A blood clot you don't want in your bloodstream by any way, shape, or form. And it looked like she wasn't going to come. And then all of a sudden, two days before the rehearsal and performance, she got better. Got on train, came down to Washington. Now, there, not only is there four, uh, 450 seats in the theater, but the pit is extremely small. You can only really squeeze 36 players into that pit. We had three conductors for that show. My job was to conduct the finale to the first act of Barber with the cast, accompany Jerome Hines in Dormir o Sol from Don Carlos, and Miss Malfitano in Juliet's Waltz from Romeo and Juliet by Gounod, and two scenes from Gilbert and Sullivan, Su Gilbert and Sullivan, with Gene Stapleton and the doily cart famous John Reed, who was in the area performing with us a, uh, 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 a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. I was conducting that too, for that matter. Well, I did my part. And since there was really no place for me to go, I'd have to crawl over musicians to get out of the pit down below where there were entrances. I merely lifted myself up and jumped over the rail and was in the theater. Martin came down to me and said, Cal, accompany Miss, Miss Merman backstage, please. She'd been sitting over in the dark near the, st near the small stairwell that led up to the stage. She said, please help her backstage. She's going to rehearse after Tammy Grimes does her number. Tammy Grimes' husband was conducting her 
numbers, and they were working on them as I went over to say, Miss, Miss Merman, and she kind of recognized some of them were speaking to her. I said, it, it, it's time to go backstage. I'll help you. She put her hand on my forearm, and I could feel the weight of her entire body. We moved ever so slowly towards the first four, the four steps that led back to the backstage area, and each one was like climbing Mount Everest for her. I felt like I practically was carrying her. Very feeble, very slow. She didn't make any sounds, but she was having a tough, tough time. When we got backstage, of course, it was dark. She expected me, and I did, accompany her to the chair in the middle of the theater, in the middle of the, of the stage, where she was rehearsing with the uh, conductor of the Washington Opera Chorus, Bill Huckabee. Her numbers, of course, were No Business Like Show Business and the duet with Jerry Hines. So uh, Bill started the vamp to No Business Like Show Business. She complained that it was too fast. Then she complained it was too slow. Then at the end, she didn't like the way that he got, gave her the rallentando for her final button. None of this was done with very much voice, incidentally. She was so weak, one was wondering whether she would actually collapse right then and there. When she finished her rehearsal, a stagehand who was there accompanied her to one of the only dressing rooms available. The Terrace Theater is a very small place. There were maybe four dressing rooms, and three of them were being used for makeup and other things. There was no room for anyone, but Miss Merman was placed in one of those dressing rooms and a note was put on her door, do not disturb this room. No one was to go near Miss Merman's room. They were going to bring her dinner. It was four o'clock when we finished the rehearsal and the gala began at 7.30. No one was in or out of that room except the people that she attended, that were attending to her. I remember running into Sid Caesar point blank in the hallway. There wasn't hardly any room to walk around. And I also forgot that Douglas Fairbanks Jr. was there as well. This was an evening of uh, recitation, of skits, and music. Coca and, and Caesar did one of their famous bits to the delight of everybody, and the, the evening progressed like that. When Tammy Grimes had finished her numbers, I finished mine and scrunched over as far as I could, almost into the lap of the concertmaster, just to give the gentleman a chance to conduct himself. And he moved onto the other side, almost falling into the cello section, to give Bill Huckabee the reins. And the announcement came. Ladies and gentlemen, Ethel Merman. Bill started the vamp. And at that moment, with the power of a fullback and the grace of a cheerleader, without giving any indication of anything that was wrong physically with her in any way, shape, or form, Ethel Merman, the Ethel Merman, <laughs> barreled her way onto the stage. Bump, 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 hit her mark. There's no business like show. I was only about 30 feet from her. I found my jaw had fallen completely, the only time I've ever fallen. So enthralled with what was going on, only 30 feet away, the sound was absolutely deafening. Where she got the energy from the person that had been helped up the stairs and onto the stage, I don't, do not know, but it's one of the most phenomenal performances that I've ever seen, or anyone else that was there. Of course, a lot of people didn't know, only those of us that knew how she had been before the rehearsal and before the performance, knew the complete change that had happened. An amazing, amazing moment. And those are my two stories. Well, Cal, we have some questions that were submitted uh, earlier this week. First of all, from Marie. Uh, she wants to know, well, tell us about your family. How did you meet your wife, Jamie? and anything else you want to share. Okay. For six years, I was principal conductor of the Arizona Opera. And in 2001, or 2000, now it's getting rather hazy, 
I was doing Don Carlo, a magnificent work by Giuseppe Verdi, and it turned to be it turned out to be a benchmark for the orchestra and chorus and everybody. About ten days before the rehearsal period started, one of the cellists in the orchestra got a job somewhere else and was gone. The contractor tried getting a hold of a number of cellists, all of whom were either busy or were not interested. They got down to about a week before the rehearsal started, and the contractor sent out an SOS. Any string player, any wind player, anyone at all that knows a cellist that might play this gig, please take it upon yourselves to act for us and get it down and done. Well, Patricia Cosand, then the first violist of the orchestra, knew that Jamie, Jamie Guy would be free to play. She had actually played in the opera orchestra for a number of years and had only a couple of years before quit. So she called up Jamie and Jamie again thought there wasn't enough time to prepare. Don Carlos is a long, long opera, even in the four-act format that we were doing. It usually is done five acts and it's even longer. But Patricia said to her, you must come, you must, it's important, you must meet the conductor. Her words. Well, Jamie decided to take the gig. Now, I would be foolish to say that I didn't notice a very attractive woman in the back of the cello section. Of course I did. But at the same time, there were, <laughs> there are seven roles, seven major roles in Don Carlo. Only one of them only two of them had ever done their roles before. Everybody else was first-timer. And we had two casts. So I had certainly a lot on my plate, but I did happen to shake her hand and thank her for being there at the first opportunity that I had, which was during one of the first breaks. She recalls that I had a very nice handshake, which was very important for her. I had won a point for some reason or another. But one thing led to another, and after the run of the show, we went out to dinner and we got to know each other. And of course, we got married. Our boys came along quickly because they just did. Mark is now 17 and Sean is now 16. And we live in Tempe in this house and we try to get along with one another. <laughs> Uh, next question. Daniel would like to know what you are reading right now. I am reading Grant. That in mass, this book is, must, must be at least that thick. And I wish I could pronounce or even pay any attention to the name of the author because he certainly deserves credit for the monumental work that he's written. And it's, uh, I, I love history. I was, I've been a Lincoln fan for years. I've read extensively on uh, Benjamin Franklin and Jefferson and Washington and John Adams. And um, this is a, a completely different type of biography and interesting for most of us that don't know or know very much about Grant, not necessarily what he accomplished, but his personality, how unassuming he was, how kind and how quiet, how taciturn to a degree that was disturbing and how unfortunately his grandfather had an alcohol problem that must have infiltrated to him and although he tried his best to stay away from it and he had a gentleman that was his aide-de-camp on him every minute of the day to keep him away from it there were times when he had relapses into drunken binges the politicians tried to use that against him to get him removed from his commands but Lincoln said in a very famous exchange, I can't fire that man, he fights. And Grant fought. And uh, I'm really enjoying the book. I've gotten almost to Appomattox, and I'm looking forward to getting on to the rest of it. Uh, I don't know much about his presidency or what happened afterwards, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Martin is asking, What's your favorite Verdi opera and Puccini opera? Otello, for sure. And Turandot. 
Turandot is uh, a compendium of modern harmony. And it's orchestrated in an exquisite way. Puccini gets, doesn't get enough credit as being a masterful orchestrator. In fact, as complicated as Turandot seems to be, if an orchestra knows how to play and they can read the dynamics on the page, it is perfectly balanced from the beginning to end. There's hardly anything one needs to do about it except to keep it together with the cast on the stage, which presents its own set of problems. And of course, the, it's a shame that he was not able to complete it. And there's always going to be dissatisfaction in the final scene, regardless of who said it or who rewrote it. But Turandot is, is obviously a, a masterwork, no, no question about it. And th those would be my two. Otello, of course, give me Otello any day of the week. If I had to go to a desert island, I'd have to take that and The Marriage of Figaro. Those would be the two operas that I would take. I couldn't go without one or the other. Our final question comes from San Antonio. I mean, that's not the name of a person. It's obviously the town. Which composer has the my most diverse repertoire? I'm not sure I understand that. <laughs> are you talking about works that are diverse one to the other? That type of composer, I'm not sure, leaps to mind right off the bat. Um, there's a sameness about all composers. They have a certain language that they uh, recreate. One might, one could look at the early works of um, Kurt Weill, which are very dissonant and atonal, and then look at the A Touch of Venus street scene and some of the other uh, musicals that he wrote to find a completely different type of music. Bartok also went from one particular type of music to another and found, I think, a, a wonderful language in, towards the end of his life, which was tonal, but stretching tonality to a point where you had to listen very carefully and appreciate, after many listenings, what he was getting at. But I can't say really that there's anybody that is so diverse that you could list 10 pieces all different. Uh, actually, there's one more from Martin. Do you like the Alfano completion? I have dealt with the Alfano completion, and uh, Luciano Berrio wrote one, and I think there was one other person that took a crack at it. Um, like I say, we'll, we'll never be satisfied. No one will ever be satisfied with it. It's You know immediately from the first opening fifth there at the, after the death of Liu that it's a different hand that's got this piece. But at least it got done. And at least we can, we can appreciate the opera for what it is, even without the author completing it. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for this evening. Uh, once again, Cal, thank you for being with us. No problems. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon somewhere uh, <laughs> in the valley, hopefully when uh, there's a concert opening up. Boy, wouldn't we all like that. Uh, would you like to tell any, the audience here about the Youth Symphony? Well, the Youth Symphony has found a, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to miss the name. What, what is the name of the church? Center Church. Center Church in Gilbert that has graciously allowed a, a rehearsal space for the Youth Symphony. And we are going to start rehearsals on September 14th. And we have a, a string body of about 35 players and a wind ensemble of about 18. And what we plan to do is divide the string body in half. So we have 18 and 17. And we are going to have separate rehearsals for one piece. We're going to do the Tchaikovsky Serenade for strings. So half will work on movements number one and two on the, on the 14th, and the other group will come immediately afterwards and we'll do the same two movements. This, the wind players will then come at the last, for the last hour of a three and a half hour time frame. And we will go, we're going to play the second movement of the Brahms second suite in A, Opus 16, and the charming Johann Strauss serenade, Opus 7, 
one of his first works. And we will be rehearsing them separately. How we're going to get the strings together uh, for a final uh, concert has yet to be seen, with the social distancing being what it is. But we'll find a way to make it work. And we're looking forward to at least having a place to rehearse and a place to perform. Yeah, one thing we can tell the audience is that this performance of the Youth Symphony will be recorded, and we will put it on YouTube. Great. Uh, so it will be free for everyone to watch. Because we're not allowing too many people in to, to view it live because right. of the social distancing and all of that. Right. Just parents and close friends. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks again for uh, being with us this evening. And uh, everyone in the audience, thanks for joining. Good evening.